And we are now having uh, the glimpse of an insight into a very specific context, specifically in India. And we, I am now very happy to introduce Rukmini Banerjee. She's the chief executive officer of a very outstanding and very powerful NGO. It's the Pratham Education Foundation, if you don't know it. She's trained as an economist, but Rukmini has an extensive experience, in, especially in this field, working directly with rural and urban communities in India, and she's designing and implementing large-scale partnerships with governments. So I can't wait to hear you talk. Where are you sitting in this corner? There are you, Rukmini. Uh, coming from the country of Bollywood, I'm tempted to do a little, but I won't. <laughs> Um, me, uh, as an Indian, along with, I think, almost every Indian, we are absolutely delighted, amazed, and very happy that we can stand on the world stage today and say that almost all our children are enrolled in school. <coughs> we have 250 million children, which means at least 500 million parents. So, Lego, you should be where we are. <laughs> Uh, and such a big change, which has happened, I think, in the last several decades, didn't just happen because one party, maybe a government or maybe a certain section of people, decided that children should be in school. We believe very strongly that big change requires everyone. And I think in the context of our current conversation, one of the big changes that brought about this close to universal enrollment was the fact that parents could come along and that parents could understand the importance of schooling and the importance of sending your children to school at the right time. And this didn't happen overnight, but it happened over a period of time. And even though there is a small section of children who may not be enrolled in school today, I think there are many other reasons why they are out. It's not that parents don't want them in. So big lesson. If parents come along, big movements can happen. Today, we face a new challenge. I would say this is the challenge of going beyond schooling to learning. And we see from you know, everything that you have read, uh, we do a big survey in India called the Annual Status of Education Report, a very simple way to look at reading and math. You look at what the World Bank has done, putting all the different reports together. And we see that the years of schooling is not translating into learning. And again, I think there are many causes and contributors to that, and perhaps many pathways to come towards a solution. But from our previous lesson, we've learned that that will not happen unless you can bring parents along. Now, in the case of schooling, many, many, many parents, at least in India, who supported schooling very strongly had not been to school themselves. But we all know what it means to get children to school. You get them up in the morning, get their teeth brushed, hair braided, get on your clothes, go to school. Almost everybody can participate in those kinds of activities. Now when we are talking about learning, a big question comes from parents, particularly from mothers, that if I don't know how to read, or if I'm not very learned, how am I going to support my children's learning? So I think, like in India, there's big challenges in parts of the world, but how do you get over this barrier? How do you get parents actively engaged in the process of learning? How do you make them believe that learning can be many things, not just the reading and the math that we all know, but there is a whole set of other things that can be constituted as learning? And then, this activity that parents and children need to do together, how do you get a much bigger world out there to support this? I think these are the three big challenges. And I think when everybody puts their minds to it, we will, we will uh, uh, be able to solve this. I wanted to just take you through a little exercise that we are doing in India. <clears throat> this is from last summer. And I think that this was our attempt to see how we could bring some of these three or four things together in a real context in a rural setting. So I'm going to take you, we did this in several thousand villages last year. So this is just the story of one village. <coughs> in this village, um, what we are doing is, 
Uh, this was in the summer because most of our children go into school in, the, in July or in June, depending on the state in India. And so the summer is the period leading up to your transition into school. We picked this period of going into school as a major point because it's the first year and both the children and in many cases their mothers as well are quite young. And so what we did was we call it a school readiness mela. Mela is a word which means fair. Through this story you will also see that we use formats that are quite familiar. The fair format is very familiar. But a fair for going to school usually doesn't happen. And how do you use familiar formats then to bring people on board so there is something that is familiar and then something that is new? So here is a village in Rajasthan, very hot. And this is an afternoon in which the whole village is invited to come to this fair. Now what is being held up is actually a kind of card which is like a wedding invitation card. And at least in India, when you're invited to the wedding, the whole village goes. You can't really read what's on the card, but you know it's a card that, is being that you're being invited for. So an invitation was put up in the village in several places, inviting everybody to come to this fair, and also people were told about it. The second familiar format that every Indian knows is elections. We are coming up to a big one this year, <clears throat> and for an election anywhere, you have these little booths or tables. So you go in, you show your card, you get your name written, and then you move from one table to the other. And that's exactly what we did in our own school readiness mela. There are young volunteers from the village. This is a big veranda outside the headman's house, actually. And we have different people sitting there. You see a picture of one of the young volunteers being told what to do when the mothers come. And then we all waited for the mothers to come. You're allowed to participate in this fair if you are a child and you are the mother of a child who's going to go into first grade. Very strict. You can come and watch, but if you want to participate, you have to be one of those two. And the two have to come together. The first mom arrived. You can't see her face, but she's there behind the veil and with both her kids. And the first thing you do is write your name down, very typical. And then somebody in the village said, since they are here, why not take their height and weight? We didn't really want to do that, but they didn't seem to be harmful. And a lot of the young uh, middle schoolers love taking the height and weight, so go ahead. Next stop, as you can see now, it's all being written down. The gentleman in the, in the pink turban is the head man. Now, the head man in a village, head man or head woman, in the village is a very important person. And he told me, that I am a very important person, I have lots of things to do, so I may not be here for too long. Just watch him, okay? Okay. Next stop, kids had to walk on a curvy line. And everyone is watching as they walk on the line. You see the head man there, one of the kids refused to walk. And his mother could not convince him. And we thought that was fine. But Mr. Headman felt that's not okay. Every kid in my village must walk on a curvy line. And so he went and brought a pack of cookies. And for every step the kid took, he would give them a cookie. <laughs> Whether this is right for child development or not, I don't know. But it was great for participation. Next stop is a newspaper folding stand. What are the different things that you can do with newspapers? And again, this was an attempt to say that this doesn't look like academic stuff. But you have newspapers everywhere, and there's a whole bunch of things that you can do. And as the mom and the child went through, it was a little difficult to tell who was having more fun. Because I think many of our parents need play, whether it is with the children or not. Because we haven't played in a long time, and we haven't had the time to do that. And so on and so forth. This is the table for classification. You had to separate the onions from the potatoes, you had to separate out the big stones from the small stones. And in some cases, they actually had sticks that you had to arrange in an order. Things that you can learn that don't necessarily require being in school. And you may notice, you don't even require bricks. <laughs> uh, we go on and on and on. You get the idea. The next, there were several other booths. In some places, you had... Uh, other activities that you did, again, a lot with just ordinary common things that were available. The coloring one, I think, was one of the most popular. <clears throat> uh, 
And you can see that the uh, action moved from the top of the table to under the table. And in fact, on the floor, you can see sometimes a little bit more participation uh, from the adults. Uh, and then, of course, we had some you know, pictures and some letters and some other uh, math things. But across the board, you can see there's a mother and a child, there's a young volunteer, and there's everybody watching. And Mr. Headman didn't leave, because this was getting too exciting. And almost the whole village turned out. And if you have to win your next election, it's important to be where everyone is. <laughs> and so finally, we used another format, which I think is very, very, and you saw what your Indian parents did in the survey. Everybody likes certification. So at the end of this process, there was a certificate that was given to the mother and the child for having participated in this entire effort. And the headman said that he will give out the certificate. <laughs> because it's important, it's a valuable thing. And there was a little kit as well, which had a few of these coloring books and things that we wanted mom and child, we didn't say who it was for. We said both of you together can do this for the couple of weeks before you go to school. It was hugely successful and we learned a lot. We learned that we really, that at this time in the fair, huge value was given to mother and child. Uh, there were some mothers who didn't make it in the first hour. People would go to their house and say, come on, hurry up. You know, you are supposed to be here. Here is a grandma. And I want to make a plug for her because I'm a grandma too. And she couldn't participate because she was not the mother of a, uh, a kid going to first grade. And so we took time out to explain to her what was going on. And then we whispered in her ear, it's OK. You can do some of this stuff with the kid at home as well. But for us, in our context, giving this time and this value to the young mother and her child was very important. In many cases, the young mother hadn't been to school herself. And therefore, in front of a huge, big village audience, to say, you are the most important person, and you can do it. And what you have to do is actually very straightforward. Go from one booth to the other and do these things. Just opens up the possibility of what she can do, but also of how the village should value both of them together and support them in their journey. We want to hang on to this group, to this duo, for the next five years, because we think that this journey will be very different from when the kids are sent to school alone and the mother stays outside the gate. We're going to do this in maybe five or 6,000 villages this summer. It's very hot, but if you'd like to come, you can come and join the fun. I think on this platform, many more things can be done with more resources or less. But I think the idea is simple enough, and it can be taken forward. So I'm going to leave you with, uh, oh, it's exactly at 0, 0.00. Uh, I'm going to leave you just with a little flavor. Uh, <clears throat> India has a very large early childhood uh, system provided by the government, which provides uh, nutrition and immunization. And they're supposed to also do some early childhood education and development. And sometimes that falls by the way because the nutrition and the health requirements are so high. We work with several thousand of these centers. And we do a little bit of things with the mothers. And so before I get off the stage, I'm going to just show you a little glimpse of that. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you so 